And I'm David from Levica Photography, and today I'm in Italy. And we are at the Relay Il Crostillo di Pienza, which is uh, somewhere in Tuscany. And this place is amazing. And the reason why I'm here is actually for my 20th wedding anniversary. But the real reason why I'm here is so I can review the Pen F. No. Actually, I'm here for my 20th wedding anniversary. I just happen to have this with me, so let's go ahead and review it. All right, let's dive into this. Uh, this thing is a lot like Italy. You know, it's kind of funny. We came into Venice, and uh, Venice is very strange. It's a lot of, uh, how could I put it, uh, a lot of tchotchke and crap, street vendors everywhere, doesn't make Italy feel authentic at all. And when you first turn on this camera, you get the weird art filters and stuff like that, which to me doesn't make the camera feel authentic at all. But then you go into the heart of it. And it's like the heart of Italy where we are now. So anyway, let's dive into this puppy and see what it's like. Okay, using this thing is extremely easy to use. Even though it's like holding a brick or a bar of soap up to your face, or maybe even your remote control for your TV, uh, it, it is actually very well designed ergonomically. I don't exactly understand how they got the ergonomics for this thing right, but it has a thumb pad back here, and it has a slight taper to the body this way. And that makes this hand just fit perfectly right here. and gives you access to these. And then just by holding this corner, you have access to the thumb pad, dials, whatever you need back here. Um, so ergonomically, it's actually very well designed. Uh, I don't really feel like I need the extra grip with this one like I did with the EM52. The EM52, for some reason, I keep wanting to drop that every single time I don't have the grip on it. But let's talk lenses really quick. So this is the 45mm f1.8. I call this the trifecta. The 25 millimeter f1.8 and the 75 millimeter f1.8. These three lenses here, right here, very small, very compact, very light, and these are the sharpest Olympus lenses that you can possibly put on your camera. Now, for some reason, on micro four thirds, 12 is the magic number. So the Rokinon 12 and the Olympus 12 are both equally as sharp to each other. Out in the field, these things are perfect to use, and this makes for an extremely light camera bag. But, what is it actually like using this in the field? Well, you have a high-res function on here that will give you an 80 megapixel RAW or a 50 megapixel JPEG. That's amazing to use, but you gotta be in situations where there's no wind. And uh, the, the new 20 megapixel sensor on this is amazing. Now, as far as video goes, you know, you don't have a microphone jack, so you can't really do video recording with it. So for me, it's going to be a secondary camera if I do any video with it. Um, just not all that exciting. But this thing, when you're shooting with it, just shooting photography, is just a joy to use. Because of the way it's laid out, it's just, it's really meant to be kind of a quick draw situation and the thing is, you know, you can compare this directly with the A6300. Um, the A6300 has slightly better dynamic range than this does. But, you know, this just has a cleaner image. I don't know why, but it's, I don't know, the format's better. Instead of 2x3, you're shooting 4x3, uh, which is a traditional painting size. So, you know, image sizes like 18x24, um, 32 by 40, you know, these are standard paintings that you would buy, so to me that shape feels better. And it's also perfect for magazine advertising, because that's the size of a full page ad is usually somewhere around, you know, 8.5 by 11 or something like that, or 9 by 12 actually. So, you know, that three quarter format seems to work perfect as far as actually professionally shooting for publications. Now the other thing too is this is also because of that 80 megapixel RAW, it makes it the perfect still life and studio camera. Uh, let's take a look at some of these photos and see what they're like. I can't tell you how amazing this place is.
So let's just take a look at that file really quick. I just want to show you the amount of detail in here. And, you know, this was shot with high res mode. And down here, way down here, you see just a little bit of wind and you see this kind of cross hatching effect. Um, that's the only spot in the entire photo where that's happening. The rest of it is pretty steady. So, you know, the resolution in high res mode is just insane. I mean, I can't believe how much detail I'm pulling out of this. And the file size is just gigantic. You know, on this it's, uh, yeah, 34 and a half by 26 at 300 dpi. I mean, that's a huge, huge file. All right, now one thing I did want to show you was regular raw detail. And let's just take a look at this image here. Now this is a very mediocre image from the trip. Something that I wouldn't plan on using, but can I save it? Well, like I said, there's a lot of adjusting room on here, so let's go ahead and throw down a graduated filter from the bottom to the top. And I've already got this set, apparently, to increase my exposure when I'm dragging it up. So that's already brightening the lower portion of the image. And then I think I'll throw in another gradient tool over here, but I want to do the exact opposite this time. I want to actually darken this side. But you want to keep the clarity and the dehaze factor kind of up. So let's bring the exposure back just a little bit. Somewhere around there. And then I want to go to my overall image here and let's just increase the exposure just a little bit to where it's starting to look pretty good. And then we'll pull down our highlights overall. Let's drop those all the way down. Increase the exposure again to where it looks pretty good. And now we can go in and actually do our, uh, our lens correction. Go over here, give it a quick tilt up kind of a quick rotate this way and then we'll scale it up to fit everything and I think that's about right right there so let's go ahead and open it and there we go so you know a usable image right off the bat all I need to do is probably sharpen it and save it or if I want to adjust any of this information that's in there but realistically, I think this is good enough. When I was on the high-speed train, I did some video recording of us leaving, I believe this is Bologna, and I tried to uh, set it up so I, I, I wouldn't get much rolling shutter in video. Now this is done at 60p, and I just wanted to see if, if there is much uh, shutter roll and there really isn't you know you don't see the jello effect here it just looks like normal good video but in silent shutter mode it's a different story and this is what I saw in silent shutter mode now these trees were along the road and they were actually supposed to be vertical so what you're seeing is a normal image behind them but these are actually twisted and that's very strange and then this was right off the train tracks. So you can see, you know, it's just completely shifting a little bit. Skewing is what I should say. And then here's another good example. The silent shutter mode, it definitely has a little bit of shutter roll, but, you know, in movie mode, it really doesn't. So it was very surprising to see that. Um, and I use silent mode all the time, especially when I'm doing like weddings and stuff like that. All right, let's take a look at the Pen F and see what they got right and what they got wrong. Now, this is the OMD EM5 Mark II. Essentially, this is almost the same camera, minus the weather sealing, microphone port, and a few accessibility features. Comparatively, they're about the same size. The eyepiece is a little bit bigger on the EM5 Mark II, but the back is identical. Same articulating screens on both, pretty much the same controls, but where this one, the M5 Mark II, had an issue, or at least I thought it had an issue, this stupid lever where you change the ISO button. On here, it's very simple. 
All you have to do to change the ISO is hit this top button and roll through the dials. This acts like a DSLR, which is more of what I prefer. This lever on the EM5 Mark II is easy to bump in uh, intense situations where you're shooting a lot, especially events, and you can change the white balance without ever even knowing it, so that becomes a problem. But realistically, they are roughly the same size. Uh, this is a new design. For some reason, it's not weather sealed, and I don't understand why it's not for the price point. Now, the other thing that they got wrong on the Pen F is this is where the memory card door is on the M52. On this one, for some reason, they put it next to the battery. Why, I don't know. And while we're upside down, let's take a look at the uh, tripod port. So on, on the M52, you've got a distance of a quarter of an inch from the flange of the lens to the flat spot. On this, it's only a sixteenth, so when you're using non-Olympus lenses, it's hard to mount them when you're using a, a tripod. So you have to use either a, a small washer or the grip for this setup. So it makes it kind of problematic. You'll notice it's missing the microphone jack. Now, apparently there's room for it, they just didn't put it in. I'm not sure exactly why they did that. I think that's kind of messed up. But uh, that and then on the front of the camera, the main thing that I do use on this that this doesn't have is the PC sync port for old studio strobe kits. And I do actually have an old studio strobe kit that I use quite often. So it's kind of a bummer that this doesn't have it, but it's not a deal breaker. Overall, internally, it's the same camera. Uh, this is a 16 megapixel sensor. This is a 20 megapixel sensor that is the only difference but in the field this thing is a joy to use uh, simply because that 20 megapixel sensor makes it feel more like film all right so here's some video samples from this camera You know, like I said, it doesn't have any external microphone jack, so it, you really don't want to use it for recording on your main, as your main camera. But you can use it as a secondary camera because the video quality does actually match the OMD EM5 II, which I think does a very good job. I mean, really, this is meant to be a photographer's camera, not a camera that does video like the A6300. Uh, you know, for something like that, might as well just use A6300. Uh, I got this thing right when it first came out. I mean, I was probably one of the first people to get it, and I wasn't that enthusiastic about it. I got it because I wanted it as a second studio camera because the high res, the 80 megapixel RAW in this thing is freaking phenomenal. And when you team it up with the right glass, it's just amazing. And usually in the studio, when I'm doing catalog work, I like to put the, the Nikkor 55mm Micro on there and shoot somewhere around f5.6. And I do a lot of, uh, of shooting of paintings for reproduction. That's like a huge part of my job. Or I'm doing a lot of product photography for smaller companies. So, you know, you need that kind of capability. I mean, it's just kind of key. You know, I bought it for that purpose. It wasn't really a walking around camera to me, so I didn't really think of it as being exciting. I thought the design was actually kind of boring. And I prefer the ergonomics of the EM5 Mark II with the grip even more. Um, but overall, you know, really taking this thing out and shooting it for the past three weeks as my daily shooter has been amazing. I mean, I've, it's completely changed the way that I thought about it. It works the way that I want a camera to work. And when you're a professional photographer, it's different than being an, an enthusiast because you know you're looking for the utmost image quality that you can possibly get out of something but you don't want to lug around a lot of stuff an enthusiast doesn't care they just want the biggest best thing that they can possibly get 
But when you're doing this professionally day in and day out, you know, you don't want to do that. But at the same time, you still want to look like a professional. That's one of the problems I have with the Sony a6300. Is you take that thing out in public and people are just like, they don't say anything. If you show up to a photo shoot with it, they're like, really? You know? But if you show up to a photo shoot with this, then people are like, that's a really cool vintage looking camera. What is that? You know? And then it, it starts a conversation. So, you know, it's kind of like the Vespas here around Italy. You know, it's like, you see something old and vintage and really cool, it starts a conversation. But when you see the, the latest Fiat Panda, you know, it's, it's built for a purpose, but it doesn't really look like anything great. It's just kind of there. You know, that's the way the A6000, A6300 to me feel, but they're very portable. But a lot of times when I want to be discreet and I don't want people bugging me about what I'm doing, I'd prefer to have that camera on me because nobody bugs you about it. Um, so, you know, it has its ups and downs. But anyway, at the end of the day, my only complaint uh, besides the things that I addressed with the design of the camera, the memory card not being over here, uh, the tripod mount being in a stupid spot and very uh, ridiculous to use. The only other thing is this function menu right here. And when you turn this on to make changes, uh, you have to go back to that button and turn it off. You can't just hit the shutter button to make it go away. And sometimes you forget and you know, you're know you like, oh God, I need to get rid of this thing and you're panicking. And then you you hit it and then you hit it again and it shows back up and you're like, God damn it. So that part is kind of annoying. But what I did find was that I love shooting this this way. I love using the viewfinder. I love the fact that it has this texture on the back and it feels like a camera should feel. Just cool. So anyway, I hope you guys like this review. Give me a thumbs up. Leave a comment. Otherwise, you guys have a good day and we'll talk to you later. See ya.